My name is Bob Togren. I'm a retired military, uh, currently a civil service out of Randolph Air Force Base and city council, and I've got several other hats that we wear with, within the local community. What inspired me to be me? Wow. That's a question I've never even thought about before. That's a tough one. Uh, Josh, you told me for a loop here. I think I started out when I was young. Uh, Dad was in the military, lived at a base out in the Rapid City, South Dakota. It was like all wind. First time I ever saw horizontal snow in my life. I mean, it was like, but you're isolated. I had difficulty in school. Uh, I was in three elementary schools, being in the military, three elementary schools in one year. So to this day, I may still get how to spell what or there or there. It's an E-I-R-E-R-E, -R -E. you know, it's just that basic foundation. And so as I went through the military, at a certain point, my brother came down with leukemia. And so that sort of changed the family life, the family dynamics. The brother became the focus um, as we went, you know, when you have a 1970s car and your ice maker, your air conditioning in your car is an ice maker with a fan on it, you know, in the bottom, you know, you put ice in the morning so you can get down to the medical center on the other side of town and still be somewhat cold as you're watching your brother suffering from the chemotherapy from the 100 degree heat San Antonio. And it's like, you know, I wanted to be, I wanted to be in a better position where I could have that car and have that life or somebody else would be that because we were on our own as a family. Um, for many months I lived with relatives uh, because my family couldn't afford to get me cross country to join them here in San Antonio, so without my parents. And so I had to learn how to live with, you know, an aunt, uncle that may not necessarily, you know, they love me, but I'm not their child. And uh, that was difficult. And then other parts of my life is, uh, you know, I lost my, my brother eventually to cancer. In that same time period, I lost uh, my dad to cancer. Before we got him buried, uh, the government told me that, hey, you're getting ready to deploy off to the war, going off to Iraq. And when you get back, we're going to reassign you to another state for career progression. At the time, then I ended up in the hospital. So we had my brother in one hospital, dad in another hospital. Mom suffered a stroke while she was in the hospital at appointment with one of my other family members. Uh, we were in three different hospitals at one time. And you know, you hit a point of depression even. And it, uh, it became real. And so to get through those struggles, you fall back on what do you do for others? Um, that was a point where I could help others. I needed to help myself. So it's an emotional time. I'm holding back tears now as it is. But um, you do. And it's those that you look up to the mentor, um, those that you mentored throughout the years, they come to your aid. But it was perfect because at that point in my life, I had loved helping other people, connecting their dots. And people saw that I was getting spaces in my, in my life. And they rallied. And as a result, they brought me back to person as a whole and uh, strengthened relationships, business relationships, professionalism. Um, you know, made me a better person today. But here again, it was that pothole. And it was a deep pothole. And I got in it, had a difficult time climbing out. But I've always told people, if you're going to look down upon someone, it's because you better be handing them a hand to help them up. Too often in today's society, someone looks down on them, and that's because they're taking their foot and pushing them down to achieve success. If you can look down on someone, hand them the hand, and help them either come to your level or push them up to a, raise them to another level. That's my purpose in life. Someone help me, and I'm going to help others. That's Bob Tolbert. Leadership is one of the things that I've sort of learned from well, good mentoring and also through, again, through the scouting program. You'll hear that a lot from me. The scouting program was just a phenomenal experience as far as you know, hard impacting in my life. And I was able to share that forward. I remember joining the military and having that background in me that I got to my first, first military base in New Mexico and I shot on base and their scout troop was dying. They had like eight active members. And I wanted to be a part of it, 
but I couldn't let that die knowing the impact that it would have on others. And there were some that were very close to making Eagle Scout knowing that they weren't going to achieve that because it was a small town and there weren't too many other units that, that they could go with. Uh, so I made a difficult decision uh, because I was underage, quite honestly. I think we lied on our age uh, just so we could become the scout leader. And so for one month they waived my, my birth date and sort of forgot that he's underage. And I became the youngest scout leader in the state of New Mexico for a Boy Scout troop. We started with about eight kids. And when I left about two and a half years later, we were over a hundred. Uh, we'd go to summer camps and we would staff the summer camps. We had 21 people, adults, on our committee. And it was, you know, difficult. When you're the little one striper, probably one of the youngest on the actual base itself, yet you've got full bird colonels and those that equally greatly outrank you. The one thing that kept it constant was remembering myself that I'm in charge, I'm responsible, I'm the leader. I'm only two years older than the scouts that I'm managing, but I'm the leader. I had to remind myself that and how would I want to be led? And with that, it was just had a good time, live outside the comfort zone, what makes things exciting, and we had a good time. We learned and we've had many Eagle Scouts come out of there and the troop is still alive today to the best of my knowledge. Uh, the various hats that I wear, uh, we've got, I've had several what I call foster children or a lot of mentees come through the house. Each one of those has their own special interests from culinary arts to barber shop to home improvement, you name it, quite a wide variety. And so with that we may open and start a small business uh, to help them actually learn the trade and become successful on their own if they wish. Some of the, the small business that we've started, uh, we had a small catering company that turned out at one point we did a wedding for 300 people in like 72 hour notice and I'll put them up against some of the finest hotel and catering companies in the, in the San Antonio area. Uh, their displays and their food was phenomenal. Uh, we've had a home improvement businesses, uh, local uh, what we call helping hands. Uh, we'd go to seniors and other individuals that might be financially challenged or health or something along that line. Recognize they had a problem, they'd knock on the door and they would work to raise the money to fix whatever that might be for landscaping, painting, scraping a house, whatever it might be. One of the main businesses that we started, and it's sort of a hobby, it was a passion when I was, as I grew up. Uh, my background was in Boy Scouting, and I grew up, that was sort of our family stable during tough times uh, in my family, and then uh, one of the things was called Discovery Challenge, and it's, uh, it's a teen development. It's not a physical aspect, but it's on a five acre ranch out there in Cibolo, Texas. But we teach, we take groups of individuals from seven to a hundred and work with them on a team basis. And in the end, they become more cohesive, more networked. They understand leadership, conflict management, communication. And we take some of the young men and women that I work with as well as some of the other local community members. And they actually go out and learn how to facilitate and become leaders themselves in the process of putting on the whole event. There actually are no employees. What we do is as individuals come forward and say, hey, I've got an interest in this, you, know, you sort of learn through interaction and net networking. Hey, I've got a 17-year-old son or a daughter that is really interested in your teen development or is really interested in culinary arts. Um, and so they become, the, I guess, the employee for the event or for the quarter or whatever that the, they may need. It's, there's no actual employee on a payroll anywhere. And we have Discovery Challenge, which I mentioned is the teen development course. Uh, in the Boy Scout industry, they call it a COPE course. It's a challenging outdoor physical endeavor. Uh, it's just a series of ropes and cables and trees and you name it, whatever we can do to create these little activities. But it is a nonprofit. started out that way. It was actually, uh, we formed a Boy Scout unit that got together and built it. And it actually is now encompassed. There are five buildings, like a pioneer town, because it's a way to call it, it's our outdoor classroom. And in that outdoor classroom, we have five Eagle Scout projects that have been conducted out there. We have a 30 foot by 60 foot rustic pavilion with cedar poles that are about the size of a dinner plate uh, at the top and a pizza pan at the bottom. They're so large. And it was built by 12 year olds to 19 year olds. About 30 of them, like busy bees, built this. Uh, and it gets used by the local church, uh, Discovery. And they, it seats uh, about 100 people. Wells Outdoor Stadium Seating Campfire, uh, Pioneer Town, Marshall's Office, Blacksmith Shop. It's phenomenal. Archery range, tomahawk throwing, a little bit of everything out there. But it's all built by youth for youth primarily. 
Started working at age 16, and it was um, right here in the city of the great city of Live Oak, Texas. Uh, we had a pool at that time. We weren't really an incorporated city, but we had a, what we call the Live Oak Village Civic Association, and I became the pool boy. You know, up at learn some discipline. It was like a paper boy route. I mean, at 5:30 in the morning, you're waking up to go down to the pool, and that's difficult when you're a young teenager uh, to go out there and clean and scrub and vacuum and chemicals and the whole bit. And I learned a lot from that um, because it doesn't pay all that much. But you're in charge of the set of keys for a swimming pool as a teenager. That's there's a lot of tempting. But you learn responsibility, and from there it sort of moved on from there to what I do now. But it's still, most of it's based on community and here in Live Oak. Original goal for working is probably for most. It started out with for, well, I wanted a career, I needed money. And to have those girlfriends and those nice cars and everything else, you had to have money. Uh, but as I learned, as I sort of grew up, that the fun of it all it wasn't just the job. It became, you know, I had a set of skills or a background that, well, how could I connect the dots for other people? So I could, I'm doing a job, but they needed something done. And I, this person knew that person and we connect some dots and pretty soon, you know, you had this little network. And so it became more of, well, how can my current job help somebody else? And it was just became a networking. So granted, I still still make money, but in the end, I'm helping other people achieve their dreams and goals. And that's really what makes work for me fun. Initially, when I was younger, success was money. Having those things that I didn't have when I grew up. You know, when you grow up and you've got a, a kitchen table that's a card table that you borrowed from one neighbor and you got three chairs that came from two other neighbors. Success at that point was being able to own your own table at one point. Um, now I measure success in just happiness. You know, you get to a level of the money really doesn't matter. Um, if I'm making somebody else happy, in turn I find that they will turn make me happy through their happiness and their successes. So if I have a down or I have a low, someone's picking me up. So it became just happiness is how I've now measured success. And I think I'm successful in that area. I've been asked the question, who's my mentor many times? And I've really had to think about it many times. And I can't say that I have one. Uh, every chapter in life, you come up with a new mentor, a new interest. Um, I've had, for the longest time, it was uh, my parents. My dad was there along the way with Boy Scouts. He was a, a Chief Master Sergeant in the Air Force and he had some great achievements and so I joined the Air Force. Not necessarily to follow in dad's direction, because um, <laughs> quite honestly I had no interest in the military watching him serve. But for some reason I, you know, the, the, the flip switched and uh, gave up J.C. Penney and said okay management I'm going to move on to something bigger and better. Uh, but then my interest would change and then I had a a neighbor that became a mentor. He was involved in something called Back to Basics. He was like a mountain man group where they had a fort. I mean, this is like really cool. They built a fort and they were throwing tomahawks and black powder rifles and that intrigued me. Well, then I found out about his life and what made him who he was and how he was handcrafted everything with his hands and wood and iron. And so he became a mentor and then different bosses and so, you know, whatever your interests are, you should seek out a mentor find one. And so I'm always on the look. So yeah, I may have two, three mentors today and I'll have two, three mentors tomorrow. We don't have all the answers. So when someone asks, well, who is a mentor? Why do we need mentors? Because we're actually, we don't, we only know what we know. And a mentor may know a new direction or see something in me or see a path that I've not seen or experienced. And they just give me direction. They're the rudder to the sail. I may have the motivation, but they keep me in the right direction. One of the things that I enjoy most about my work, and my work is various. Like I said, I've got various different companies, community service groups, nonprofits, my main you know, my community service with the city of Live Oak, things like that. But the one constant thread that I put is called service. Service to God, country, others, and self. If you live your life in that order, you're successful, and that's that common thread that also, that's what I enjoy the most. It helps others, and it helps myself. So to elaborate a little bit further on the God and country, service other and self, Boy Scouts really started for me. After changing the uh, Eagle Scout, that was one of my goals. And I learned how to set goals and achieve goals. So service to God and country, I was able to do that with Boy Scouts. That set my foundation. Well then joining the military. I mean, to me, that it supported my, my service to the country. 
at a, a greater, more meaningful level. Like most recruits, you get your first join for that first, you know, I'm going to sign for four years only. That's it, no more, I'm getting out. Um, and you find out how much fun. I mean, I ended up in 21 different countries as a result of my service to the government and to the nation, to the people of, of the country. And so from there we had, I had my God, I had my country, I had my faith. Um, and then I learned that, you know, if you help others, I found more enjoyment out of that because I had a broad background so I could share that with people. And I enjoyed the, I don't know what it was, you know, if I had a skill from one of my mentors that said, hey, you could do leather work or wood carving. And I could share that with somebody else and that sparked them. And now I've got someone like cooking, for example. I think behind me, I think they've got some pulled pork from anybody who worked on it. At one o'clock this morning, he's still in my back grill, searing it just perfect, you know, watching him chop the, the herbs and everything. So you can give service to others. And through that, you know, you get enjoyment. And then finally, yourself is the last one. And so if you're taking care of the top three, you just fall into place. The number one thing that my dad instilled in me was your number one job is to take care of your boss. Now that can be at any age. You can define that as being, take caring mom and dad, a church member, anyone that you may, may look up to or that you fall under. But in the work environment, if you take care of your boss, and that is by anticipating their needs, understanding their wants and their needs, uh, what's going to make them look good and successful, uh, coming up with solutions, potential solutions to problems, identifying problems that they might not even be aware of, and just being open in communication. By taking care of your boss being that number one job, in turn that boss will take care of you. And I have found that to be the most influential aspect to my life and my success. And I do that to all my mentees also. You take care of the boss, some people say, oh, that's sucking up. It's actually not. You're actually doing what you're, what you're paid to do. You have an hourly wage, you have an employed. He didn't hire you to make him money. You took care of, you're taking care of him. And that's what we need to do. I think the secret to my success is I like people a lot. I like to communicate. Uh, life begins at the edge of your comfort zone. If you live within your bubble, you're not experiencing life. Life is that person you haven't met yet. It's the challenge that you haven't, you haven't even touched yet. So you have to live outside that bubble. Uh, it's fun to go in to go grocery shopping. Talk to people by name. Ask them what their name is. Ask the person next to you is choosing bread. Why did you choose the extra thick? Do you like the extra thick toaster? You know, just talk with people. It's amazing, and how many people will just open up to you and talk at the gas pumps, uh, the person checking you out, the person that's picking up your trash and vacuuming your office. Get to know their story. And as a result of that, I've got to meet some amazing people. And as a result, uh, just like yourself, Josh, I mean, we got, got to meet through unusual circumstances, and here we are today. But it's that network, and you never know. Three, five years from now, uh, they're part of your network that's helping somebody else. And here it goes. Now you're back into that sharing others, and it just makes a uh, makes a great purpose in life. The words of wisdom that I can say to pass on to the next generation is going to be: Don't be selfish. Get to learn who those are around you. Look to help others in your community, and they in turn will actually help you succeed in life. Make that your number one goal. Don't live in a bubble. Live outside your bubble. Challenge yourself, and you will succeed. Failure, that is one of those topics that you say, well, I hate to fail. And that is probably one of the short, one of the short-sighted aspects that people fall into. It's a trap. Um, I look at it this way. So when you go to a rifle range and you could spend all day long just taking and looking down, down that, that barrel, looking through the lens and trying to get that perfect shot and you'll aim and aim and aim and you never fire the gun. But you don't know that you've missed the target or how far you've missed the target from what your goal is until you fire that gun. You have to take the steps and take the action. If you fail, you now know how far you are from your actual success. Now you can measure how far you are. Without that measurement, you don't know as far as, okay, now I need to move the gun a little bit up to the left, I got to alter this, I got to change my breathing and pull the trigger again but you have to keep trying. Don't be afraid of failure. Failure is probably one of your best friends. You learn from it. If you don't learn from it, that's failure. But fail, choose to fail. That's how you learn.
I think that's one of the best learning tools. I would like to see future generations become more involved. Uh, it just in themselves, their own success, and involved in others. I think in past times there's a lot more people involved in community service. It's heartbreaking to see groups like the Kiwanas, Lions Club, Optimus Clubs, uh, Freemasonry, other types of groups that are community oriented that are having and struggling with difficulty in type registrations. Uh, even the scouting program. Uh, from Boy Scouts now are including girls, we got Boys and Girl Scouts. They're having to take unusual lengths of action, I guess you could say, to try and make themselves succeed in today's environment. And I think that's a foundation for success and for people. And so if they would get involved in their local community, I think that is where our next generations need to focus on. What would I like the world to know about me? I like life. Life is fun. Life is what you make of it. You have your ups, you have your downs. It's the potholes that make me appreciate the mountaintops even better. Um, so it's just have fun in life. Do the best you can. Every day is not, not given. Uh, make the best of it. And I think I've done that. What do I enjoy doing when I'm not working? Well, I don't have TV. <laughs> There's this, I like to keep, keep busy. Um, I think I grew up in the wrong era. I'm not really sure. My backyard is basically 1800s, uh, you know, old 1700s tables in a guest house. So I like throwing tomahawks. I'm rebuilding a covered wagon in the backyard as we, as we speak. Uh, I like antiquing. I like cooking. Cooking to me is, I don't actually call it even a hobby. Cooking is like, to me, it's like therapy. You know, you have a tough day at work. I come home, pet the dog on the way in and how can I either follow a recipe or how can I take that apple? What can I do to that apple that I've never been done before or seen before and just get creative? If I fail, well, it's only an apple. But I'm going to give it all the care and love and attention that I can and come up with something new with it. It's just, I don't know. I just like to do something that's challenging to the mind and relaxing. A cup of tea at night, watch the sunset, and just enjoy life with friends. The best days of my life. I was thinking about that actually uh, the other day, so someone asked me, it's like, Bob, you've got so many memories, so many stories. What was your best? And I really don't know. I've actually thought about it. I mean, I've been blessed with some great, I mean, family life was great. It has its ups and downs like every family life. But through dad and through the military, I got to see great parts of the nation. That was a great period of my life. Then I got stationed overseas in Europe and I got to see 21 countries. Um, every new experience I walked in, man, this is the best time of my life in Belgium, you know, listening to the cattle moving or moving along the road, you know, on the cobblestone streets, you know, the sound of the cappuccino sitting at a coffee shop in Paris, or just sitting to a really nice meal in a restaurant where the service just works out to be perfect for the anticipating your needs and you're actually to enjoy the experience of, of what's on your palate and the plate to, just sitting in the backyard. It's just, uh, I don't know, difficult question. I don't know if I actually have an answer. How did I obtain me? How did I achieve me? Um, I'm just I'm just a guy that's gonna turn 55 this year, hit the double nickel. There's a lot of different people in me. We talked about the mentors early on in the interview, and that's me. I took the best of all the different mentors I've had. So the more mentors I have, the more diverse I became. And that's why really people need to have mentors. But I'm the kind of guy that I like doing stuff with my hands. Um, I like to solve my own problems if I can. But if I can't, I have a network that I know I can reach out to somebody that can help me solve those problems. And in that, I learned something else. Um, I learned how to communicate, how to be open with people. Uh, so I guess that's really, that became me. I became uh, a servant to the community, like I said, God, country, others, and self, um, as a result of my life's journey from the time I can remember sitting on the kitchen counter at 18 months old, helping mom bake cookies in the old farmhouse, uh, to helping someone else bake and pulled pork at one o'clock in the morning on a, on a work night, <laughs> you know, but that's me. I think one of the things that I, I really enjoyed most is I'm currently on the city council. Uh, when I end this current term, it, 
on say it'll never really end. It's one of those that duty calls we continue on, but we'll have hit 10 years, I think, at the time that my current term would, would, uh, would come up for re-election. But the whole reason that I joined City Council was at the request of one youth came toward me one day and said, I wanted to have a skate park. And they went to City Council at the time and made a presentation as one individual. And it came very close to a vote. But in the end, they were told no. When it came a little bit closer, it was saddened to see how the community would, you had those that were for, and then you those that were against. And those against, it's the usual. You know, it gets, oh, it's gonna attract the drunks and alcoholics and this and that. But in the end, the commonality that they would all come out and says, well, you're not old enough to vote, so you, your voice doesn't count. We don't hear you. That was a problem for me. And so at that point, I recognized that I wanted to run for city council. I wanted to help. What I perceived was a commonality. We had a skateboarder, and I look at skateboarding was a means of, they were like paper boys. They wake up early in the morning, they go skate in the cool of the day, in the evening. They don't have a football coach or a baseball coach telling them that you will practice at X time, X date. These are individuals who, these are toys like a bicycle that your grandparents give you underneath your Christmas tree. But we don't give them a place to play. So if you don't have a skate park in your community, your community is your skate park. But then the community will turn around and say, well, you're skating on public, on public property in a parking lot, or so you're on private property. So you end up, where do you go? You go in the ditches. Well, then you become a product of the ditch. Sex, drugs, alcohol, a lot of negative influences can happen in that out of sight, out of mind. But that's where the community placed those types of people, those individual athletes, as I call them. They would work on mastering one move of a kick flip to make their board flip hours on end. They'd fall, scrape up their knees, and people complain, well, they look bad. Yeah, they're playing the sport without pads and protective environments and super soft city maintained football fields and beautiful mode baseball diamonds. They're playing in the ditches because that's where community left them. So I ran for city council and said, okay, how can we make this, how can we make this work? And we gathered that one skater, so well, you're not alone. There's the parkour, skating, biking. All had similar individual athletes, may not be able to afford a team sport, maybe not have no interest in a team sport because those cost money. So those individual athletes that still wanted to perform, we gathered them together and they came strength in numbers. Currently they're on Facebook at 534 members strong. They also, they formed, they did community service. They became known. They had the seniors in the local community, which were your primary year voters, were not in favor, probably just through lack of education. They overcame that and they have their skate park today and it is in use from sunup to sundown and the boys did it from the grassroots up and that is phenomenal and that's why we serve today. I'm extremely fortunate to live in a city of Live Oak. We are five square miles. We're landlocked. What we own is what we own. There's no new property being tacked on or annexed. So with that, we have learned that from one city council to the next and it evolves but we've had great stability so far. We have great city leaders and great city employees and very active residents that we recognize that we do have this problem. How are we gonna do in the future? You either raise property tax, you've gotta raise money because personnel costs, infrastructure costs, nothing goes down. So over the years, we've been very particular. We are very proud to say that we're the, the current owners and going to be for the the new Ikea moving in here. It's going to open up probably about six months early. It was projected to be the summer of 2019 and right now they announced could be late as uh, early as January or early February of 2019. So just in a few months from now. But we're very blessed the fact that uh, we have a set of reserves in our money through just good penny pinching but still maintaining that quality of life for our residents. Uh, no needless spending, uh, that we've not been able to, unlike the surrounding communities during the tough time of the economics that we're just coming out of, uh, we're able to maintain a tax base. Uh, we're actually lowering taxes throughout the year. We're not raising taxes. 
And I think that's phenomenal. That, that speaks for itself in volumes. Uh, we own, you know, water is, that's today's gold. If you run out of water as a community, that's the death to the community. And, you know, we've managed to, we have enough water rights in our city to maintain us out through whatever we need for, to develop, so the rest of all of our properties developed out. I mean, that's a lot to be said for a small community. Live Oak, Texas is an amazing place.